At the Miami airport, we get reminded one more time why we like to travel on the road. Our flight is delayed several times over the course of the night as we end up roaming a deserted concourse. Finally, we depart nearly seven hours late. To Delta's credit, they did reopen the Starbucks and got us free coffee and snacks, but still, there is no excuse. We are finally airborne, and by the crack of dawn, we are landing in LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. We were supposed to be here by 10 p.m. or so last night, so we've lost our first night at the hotel. Hello everybody and welcome to Southern California, Los Angeles. We are driving uh, on the 405, which is uh, a very important highway, freeway, like they call it here. And we're driving from the airport in LAX to our hotel in Hollywood. Our next uh, exit is uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. We decided to make the most of it and enjoy the scenic route through Santa Monica Boulevard at sunrise. Passing by Century City, formerly the back lot of 20th Century Fox Studios. We also passed by the famous Beverly Hills. We make a left onto Fairfax Avenue with a great view of the famous Mount Olympus, which is populated by many celebrities. Then we turn right onto Hollywood Boulevard. After a quick stop at our hotel, we decide to have breakfast at a superb Argentine deli cafe of Cahuenga Boulevard called Solar de Cahuenga. That gives us enough energy to hike the Hollywood Hills. Our goal, to reach the summit of Cahuenga Peak, home of the Hollywood sign. We drive the sinuous streets of the Hollywood Hills, admiring the luxurious homes. Eventually, we find North Beachwood Drive, which ends at the Hollywood Ranch, the beginning of our coveted trail to the Hollywood sign. The sign originally used to read Hollywood Land, and amazingly enough, it's not all that visible from most of LA. But here's the Capitol building. We've all seen the sign in the movies, so we've gotta go there. So we begin the long and strenuous ascent to Los Angeles' quintessential landmark, the Hollywood sign. The hike turns out to be a little more than we've bargained for, but in the end, it is worth the exercise. From the trail, we can see the Griffith Observatory, which we will visit later. We are also treated to commanding views of LA and the San Fernando Valley on the other side. We finally make it to the top. From above, we enjoy a hazy view of Los Angeles, including the Hollywood Reservoir. And down we go again. Once we've descended the hill, we take a stroll on Hollywood Boulevard and the famous Walk of Fame. This famous landmark is so commercialized and overly touristy that I find it annoying and almost not worth visiting. Well, maybe just once, just to say we were there. There are people soliciting every step of the way, especially for tours of the homes of the movie stars, to take pictures with actors dressed in costumes. In my opinion, this detracts from the enjoyment of the place. There's some kind of event happening in front of the Grumman's Chinese Theater, so we'll have to revisit this venue. Moving on, here's the Dolby Theater, formerly the Kodak Theater, and for a while mockingly called the Chapter 11 Theater because of the ill-fated Kodak. We explore the adjacent mall called Highland Center. It's one of the best places to see the Hollywood sign besides hiking the hill, yes. yes, and we were up there a few minutes ago. We 
We continue walking now in the opposite direction, going east. On the corner of Vine, there is a special monument commemorating the Apollo 11 moon mission. And from that same corner we can see the iconic Capitol building. The design of the building represents a stack of records on a turntable. Stars honoring the Beatles are visible in front of the building. George Harrison. Back to our modest yet centrally located Motel 6 for a most needed nap. Remember, we didn't really sleep much last night. Hi, after we visited the Hollywood sign and some of the Hollywood Boulevard, now we're gonna take a stroll around the downtown LA. So we are uh, kind of stuck in traffic here on this um, freeway, the 101 going south. So we're gonna show you a little bit of We park our car, which I have named the California Cruiser. I mean, look at the size of that thing. I reserved a medium, not a full size, but at least it's comfy. We decide to walk around a little bit around this area. This is the Los Angeles Music Center and the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, where they used to hold the Academy Awards in the past. This older building is Los Angeles City Hall. Angel Supreme Court. Angel Supreme Court, yeah, I really meant to say Los Angeles. A little further down is the Walt Disney Concert Hall. With its unique architecture, it is also part of this music center complex. Besides its phenomenal architecture, it's supposed to have superb acoustics. We drive around downtown a little more. We cruise along Broadway Street, one of the city's oldest and most important streets, nowadays a little rundown. We continue on Broadway until we reach the Dragon Gate to Chinatown. On a previous trip, we visited this area in a lot more detail. Olvera Street and Union Station are also nearby and definitely worth a visit. There are links to those in the show notes. Time to go on. At night, we visit the Griffith Observatory, where they are holding a stargazing event. We get another commanding view of Los Angeles. They even opened up the big scope for us. In the morning, we pay another quick visit to the Hollywood Boulevard area and we finally get to see the footprints and handprints uh, in front of the Grumman's uh, Chinese theater, imprinted on the concrete for posterity. Some recent, some dating back to the silent movies era. Moving along, we have breakfast at a famous Jewish style Cantor's Deli in Fairfax. Okay, we had to do it. Although we don't have time to take the tour, at least we pass by one of the studios, Paramount Pictures on Melrose Avenue, for the photo opportunity. Next, we revisit Beverly Hills and Rodeo Drive. This time we are not really interested in the shopping area, 
the residential part of Rodeo Drive is beautiful. Our point of interest is this time is the Beverly Hills Hotel, famous for the picture on the Eagles album Hotel California. is it. If you want to see the shopping district in more detail, please refer to the video in the show notes. We were there a year ago. We decided to visit another well-known place, the Playboy Mansion. And that is our big car we have rented. Big boat. As we can see, the tour comes here as well. Moving on, we also cruise the streets of Bel Air. Just great mansions with great landscaping and we don't really know who lives there, so what's the point? Continuing in this theme, let's take a quick drive on Mount Olympus. Many celebrities, as well as uh, Russian families, live here. Okay, time for one of our last ports of call, Hippie Town, Venice Beach. Beach, what a place. It's great for people watching and I guess it could be a little bit of a culture shock for some people with all the medical marijuana being pushed and all the different colorful characters. This is the famous boardwalk where all the action is. Souvenir stores, medical marijuana clinics, tattoo shops, street performers, scam artists, restaurants, bars. Let's hear some of the local music. Yep, yeah, that's Venice Beach for you. Fully recommended for a summer afternoon stroll. A short drive north is the Santa Monica Pier. Especially beautiful at sunset. And may I say, at least on this night, the Latino hangout. There is a famous amusement park and the beautiful Pacific coast. Santa Monica Beach. There are also a bunch of performers, some okay, some not so good. After all, the Ferris wheel steals the show. Time to get on the road. We are now driving on the Pacific Coast Highway. Mm -hmm. 
We are cruising along Malibu with its lavish hilltop mansions. Here we have a fortuitous encounter with the Google Street View car. Check it out. Towards the north end of Malibu, we approach County Line Beach, a very popular spot for surfing. Let's check out the surfers doing their thing. Here we spot a peculiar plane near Oxnard. At this point, we reach Emma Wood State Beach Campground in Ventura County. This looks like a great campground, and in our future life as full time RVers, we shall definitely pay a visit. Our next stop is Summerland and the Summerland Winery for a well-deserved uh, wine tasting after such a long drive. The offshore oil rigs are also quite a sight. The next point of interest is historic Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is uh, quite picturesque. we decided to take a walk along the pier. There is this guy uh, doing solar carving, very artistic. Solar carving. <laughs> oh. The weather is perfect, one of the reasons why Santa Barbara is called the Riviera of the West. We're not going to be here for long, our goal lays further north, but this place is definitely on our to-do list for the next time we come to California. The most notable landmark that we have missed is the Spanish mission. We definitely have to go there. We got on the road again as it is our goal to reach the town of Solvang in the Santa Ines Valley. We learned about Solvang through the movie Sideways mostly about two best friends on a road trip of this area, drinking wine and breaking hearts. The restaurant, The Hitchin Post, was also made very famous by this film. Solvang, which means uh, sunny fields in Danish, was founded in 1911 by a group of Danes. Until here in Solvang. It's uh, 4 p.m., which uh, means we have about an hour, most wineries close at uh, around 5 p.m. There are plenty of bakeries, restaurants and merchants, but let's not kill ourselves here. The reason we came to Solvang is to taste wine. There are plenty of tasting rooms uh, featuring the best uh, Santa Ines Valley has to offer. We spend the next hour walking around, sampling delicious pastries and fine vinos. However, there is absolutely no nightlife in this city, as everything closes at around 5.30 p.m. That's our cue to drive north to neighboring Los Olivos for dinner at Los Olivos Cafe and Wine Merchant, also featured in the aforementioned movie. As the sun sets, it is time to call it a night and get back to our hotel, the King Frederick. We are now saying goodbye to the King Frederick. Getting back on our big boat. 
Cruiser. We are living in Solvang. At San Luis Obispo, we get back on California State Route 1, the Pacific Coast Highway, after our Santa Ines Valley wine drinking detour. We arrive to Morro Bay, originally named El Morro by Portuguese navigator Juan Rodriguez Cabrillas, because the big rock resembled the turban worn by North Africa's Moorish people. There's another theory also, uh, because uh, morro also means pebble or rounded rock in Spanish. Well, either origin works for me. The main industries are tourism and fishing, and the town's most striking feature is the morro rock, a reserve for endangered species, the peregrine falcon. We are hungry for some seafood, and this place looks nice enough. Clam chowder was very good actually. Anchor Memorial Park. And naturally, there is an anchor. Anchor Memorial Park. The park was developed as a memorial for fishermen lost at sea. We continue our journey north. We arrive to the town of Cambria, which features a pretty interesting dwelling, the Nitwit Ridge. It's a house built actually out of junk. Thousands of found objects by one man, Arthur Harold Beale, over the course of 51 years. It is considered a fine example of folk art and actually a California historic landmark. A poor man's Hertz Castle. We'll see the real Hertz Castle soon enough. We stop every few miles to admire the scenery. And this is the famous Hearst Castle, built by newspaper millionaire William Randolph Hearst as his private paradise. Probably worth a visit, but not this time. We prefer to hang out with the elephant seal at their private beach near Piedras Blancas. Apparently, and according to the park ranger on site, these are adolescent male seals just playing and getting ready for mating season. Back to the car, we approach the Big Sur, where the Santa Lucia mountains rise abruptly from the Pacific Ocean. We are treated to some of the most striking landscape this coast has to offer. Traveling alongside the, the Pacific Coast on the Pacific Coast Highway, one of the supposedly one of the best uh, road trips one can make in the United States. 
I am going to get back into the into the California cruiser now because we are about to to continue on our road on the road in this trip. Bye. We are about to cross Big Creek Bridge, an impressive double arched bridge. Further north, we stop at another vista point overlooking the McWay Rocks near Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park. Our next stop is the Big Sur Coast Gallery and Cafe for a much needed espresso, snacks, local beer and of course to stretch our legs. Next, we cross historic and iconic Bixby Creek Bridge. We are finally arriving to Monterey, California as opposed to Monterey, Mexico. This one is spelled with only one R instead of the two on the one south of the border. Monterey was the first capital of California, both under colonial Spain and Mexico. It also had the first theater, brick house, public school, public building, public library, and printing press in California. We have dinner at what looks like the local tourist trap, the Fisherman's Wharf, at this Italian place called Isabella's, which is actually not bad. As the day ends and the moon rises, we say good night. We explored the nearby city of Carmel by the sea, mainly the sea part. We arrive to the beach. Later, we visit the Mission Ranch, owned by Clint Eastwood. This is the place where we really wanted to eat the night before, instead of the tourist trap, but we called ahead of time and found out that we couldn't make it on time, as we arrived a little bit late and it closes a little bit early. Later, we found out that Dirty Harry himself had been entertaining the night before. What a fail. But moving on. Let's visit World Renowned. Monterey Bay Aquarium. Its main exhibition is the Jellies, 
featuring all kinds of exotic jellyfish. Let's admire these fascinating creatures. This is like a little light show. Of course, there are many other attractions at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, like these giant fish tanks displaying sea life in action. There is avian action as well, these fishing birds. Another great exhibit are the seahorses or hippocampus, such an exotic species. Some of them can even disguise themselves as plants. As Spock would say it, fascinating. As the sun descends, its lights illuminate a gem the size of a basketball, too large to collect. So the sun's cameras capture images of the animal instead. In the main lobby, there are life-size representations of sea creatures, giant ones. Another highlight of the aquarium is the penguins. Very funny little guys. Well, they 
is a planted daisy. Oh, now they're all going swimming. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not all penguins know how to behave themselves in public. <laughs> and with that, we say goodbye to Monterey and its fabulous aquarium. The Canary Row and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Back on the road, we continue due north. We make one last pit stop at Half Moon Bay for a late lunch. Famous lobster roll at Sam's Chowder House. We've been driving all along the Pacific Coast Highway. Now we reach a city which in my book ranks up there with all the great cities in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to San Francisco. We begin our tour of the city on the high ground. We drive up to Twin Peaks the second highest point in the city, to get a commanding view. Okay, maybe I was exaggerating a little bit, but not by much. It did take great effort to remain upright. The wind's a little too strong for comfort. We made it all the way down to the parking area where we get a more relaxed view of the city. And what a beautiful city this is. From up here, you can see the whole Market Street, all the way from the Embarcadero to the Castro. The Bay Bridge on the east, downtown. The Russian Hill. A little further, Alcatraz Island. At the west end, one of the most famous bridges in the world, the Golden Gate. Wow, it's like being at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. You can almost see everything, at least most of the city. Sharp crest. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Down we go the steep hills of San Francisco. Room with a view of the Lombard Street. We make a quick stop to check in at our hotel. And taking advantage of the good weather, we go out again. It is our intention to cross the Golden Gate Bridge to get a view of the city from the other side of the bay. It was really lucky we went to Twin Peaks earlier when we did, as it is now covered in fog. We are on the summit of Hawk Hill, 
probably and I would say hands down the best view of the city and the bridge. We are treated to the most beautiful sunset as the shadow of the mountain makes its way through the city below. The moon shines on, the lighthouse turns on and the sun disappears behind the mountain, leaving the city bathed in alpine glow. We end the day in Sausalito with this beautiful view of the city at dusk. Good morning, San Francisco! Today we are taking the tour of Alcatraz Island and its famous prison. We decide to walk to the pier, which uh, takes about half an hour, but the morning stroll gives us a chance to admire San Francisco's unique architecture. We are at the famous and touristy fisherman's wharf. Uh, we'll be back here later, but now we are ready to board the boat. The Alcatraz cruise leaves from Pier 33 near the Coit Tower on Telegraph Hill. The National Park Service welcomes you to Alcatraz Island. The cruise offers outstanding views of the San Francisco Bay. We are approaching the Rock, as the island is also referred to. The uh, thing that he was involved in was the loading and unloading of army uniforms that were sent here to be cleaned. After a quick orientation, we take a very informative guided tour of the former prison. This is the first known photo of Alcatraz from 1853. We begin, appropriately, with the morgue. It is all under renovation, so there is noise and many areas are not accessible, supposedly for our safety. We learn how the typical cell used to be like, and also about uh, all the famous inmates. The tour includes testimonials from guards and former prisoners. We step out to the recreation yard. Part of the punishment was having this great view of San Francisco. They could see the life outside. Some nights they could even hear the sounds of the city, if the wind was right. So close, yet so impossibly far. Inaccessible, forbidden. Back inside we are in the deep block, solitary confinement. This is where the most dangerous inmates spend their days and nights. We learn about the Battle of Alcatraz, in which a group of inmates took a bunch of guards hostage. Let's just say that it didn't end up very well. There are still grenade marks on the floor. More cells, more history. Some prisoners read, some learned music, some took up knitting. We get to see the administration building. Once again, a great San Francisco view. We also learn about the many escape attempts and the many ingenious methods and tools used to that end. Please help me escape. We finished the tour at the dining block and this was the last menu. Alcatraz was closed on March 21st, 1963. The tour is, of course, uh, much more extensive than what we can show you here, so we encourage you to come to San Francisco and explore the rock. We are doing some outdoors exploring ourselves. The island is a breeding home to many species of birds, some of which are protected. The flora is quite diverse as well. Flor de papel. It looks like toilet paper. 
We head back to the mainland. Our next challenge is climbing the filbert steps of Telegraph Hill to reach the top of the Koi Tower for another commanding view of the city. The climb is quite challenging. I'm going up these stairs. It must be interesting living up here. We take the elevator to the top. The 360 degree view of the city is spectacular. I take advantage to take a few pictures and stitch them into this panorama. There is a statue of Christopher Columbus at the foot of the tower. Now we're going downstairs. We zoom in on Lombard Street, which we will visit later. But right now we are going towards Columbus Avenue for lunch at Chinatown. Yeah, we're hungry. And we pig out at the House of Nanking. Fully recommended. Then we walk around a little more all the way to the Transamerica Pyramid. There is uh, this restaurant called the Stinking Rose, where everything is cooked with garlic, even the dessert. I mean, talk about bad breath. And that's it. We take the bus to the hotel and literally collapse. Sometimes you need a break from your vacation, and that's exactly what we did. We arrive at Golden Gate Park, hoping to be able to see the Japanese garden, but it turns it's already closed. So we walk around this area a little bit and continue exploring. Golden Gate Park is over 1,000 acres, 20% larger than Central Park in New York. It was conceived and built in the late 1800s. In 1903, two Dutch-style windmills were built to pump water into the park. One of them has been restored. We are at the Dutch windmill in uh, Golden Gate Park. After seeing the Dutch windmill, we reach Ocean Beach, which runs all along the west coast of the city. There's the Cliff House with its famous Camera Obscura and the Seal Rocks. Driving along the streets, we arrive at Alamo Square, famous for its postcard view of San Francisco. Kodak moment, if I may perpetuate the cliché. We continue roaming the city through Japantown. We drive down Lombard Street, famous for being the crookedest or most winding street in the world. We'll be back here. Up the hill we go! As night falls, we continue driving around. We pass once again by Chinatown. <laughs> Then we stumble upon AT&T Park, under the moonlight, just at the end of a Giants game. And yes, believe it or not, the t-shirt guy is eating some fried chicken. We also pass uh, briefly by the Castro, the United States' largest gay neighborhood. A virtual roller coaster ride takes us back to our hotel. Our hotel is the Travel Lodge Golden Gate. Cheap, but very well located right on Lombard Street. In the morning, we do Lombard Street one more time. This time, however, we are lucky enough to land a parking spot with the California cruiser on the steep incline, so we can admire the view of the street from the bottom. Yeah. 
Next, we go downtown to ride on what has to be the last unsafe, hence fun, mode of transportation in the civilized world, the cable car. We're standing at the Powell Street Terminus. To this day, they still turn the car by hand, like in the olden days. Enjoy the ride. Right there in the front, first floor. Walk on up. Okay, guys, on the left side, we got a cable car coming down to your left. This cannot be safe. San Francisco is a city which has a, what I call character. It cannot be confused with any other city. It has this unique architecture, the steep hills, cable cars. After our joy ride along the hills of San Francisco, we arrive at the Fisherman's Wharf and Girardelli Square. Girardelli Square. The area is full of shops and street entertainment. <laughs> And of course, there are the famous seafood stands and restaurants. Oh my God, it's alive! There is also the famous Boudin Bakery, self-proclaimed the original San Francisco sourdough French bread, established in 1849 by French immigrant Isidore Boudin. It combined the French technique with the prevalent sourdough. Although it has uh, changed hands along the years, it is still an iconic place in Fisherman's Wharf. And I must say, they have a great publicity scheme. Okay, yeah, zip it, I ain't gonna hear your cup like this. Are you from Texas? Oh, gee. They don't write those stories in Texas. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, hey, nice catch. Don't mess with those cowboys, right? Alright, where's that guy across the street again? Where's he at? Okay, oh, you sure you got this? Are you sure you got this? I don't want to waste my arm in this bread. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> what a catch. I mean, what a throw. After all this fun, it is time to take the cable car back.
we end our ride by Union Square. One of the city's oldest establishments is John's Grill, famous for the classic movie The Maltese Falcon. We are cruising down Market Street. It is time to leave as we cruise down Market Street. We've left our hearts in San Francisco. Now it is time to continue north. We begin our journey at the wine country. On this particular occasion, we visit the Hess Collection Vineyard in Napa Valley. It's a little bit of the beaten path, but very well worth a visit, not only because of the quality of their wines, but also because of the beauty of the state. Our next stop is Domaine Chandon, established in 1973 by Moët et Chandon of France. It is naturally, they specialize in sparkling wines. Moving on. We were here once before, back in 2008. On that particular occasion, we passed by Sonoma Valley on our way to Napa Valley, stopping at VJB for some fantastic Chardonnay. Next, we visit the Visa Tui Winery, back in Napa Valley, for a fabulous tasting. They also have a very well-supplied deli market with a great assortment of cheeses and a lot of other stuff. But the highlight of the trip is Sterling Vineyards. Located on a hilltop in the middle of Napa Valley, we take the aerial tramway to the top. From the state, the views of the valley are fantastic. There is a very informative tour on the art and science of winemaking and did I mention the views? Oh, by the way, the wines were really good too. <laughs> Back in the present, we passed by Saint Helena. We also visit Calistoga, but by now it's past 5 p.m. and all the wineries are closed, so we continue north. Tonight, we are sleeping in Clear Lake. In the evening, we get to see the 4th of July fireworks from the hotel. Unfortunately, all I have is the iPhone to shoot the video and, well, some drunken companions hanging out with me at the parking lot. Today we are driving around the lake. Clear Lake is the largest freshwater lake that is entirely contained in the state of California. The lake is supposed to be very popular for water sports, but we haven't really seen much of that. In fact, the whole area looks kind of deserted. Wrong time of the year, maybe. Here we have arrived at um, Lucerne. The Switzerland of America, around the lake. This is the California cruiser. The next town is called Nice, but I wonder if it's pronounced Nice, like its French namesake. A little further to the northwest, we encounter smaller Lake Mendocino, which is bustling with activity. 
Going back south towards Santa Rosa and Petaluma, our next destination is the Tweet Brick House, home of the Tweet Network, which stands for This Week in Tech. Its founder, radio host Leo Laporte, started podcasting back in 2005 from a table at the 21st Amendment Bar in San Francisco during Macworld. Now he broadcasts live on the internet from his multi-million dollar studio. I'd say this guy got this online media business figured out. He's inspired many people to put original content online, myself included. Let's listen in. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, where uh, the show where we cover all the week's tech news. And boy, there was a lot of it this week uh, with, the, with some of the great minds, the pundits, the, the commentators, the th great thinkers in the industry, starting with a guy who's a regular on This Week in Google, a professor of journalism at the City University of New York, the author of What Would Google Do? and a brand new book called Public Parts, Jeff Jarvis. It's good to have you. Welcome. It's good to be here. I wore my Borg shirt in honor. <laughs> yes. Does that mean you're in the Borg or you're, what's? <laughs> it actually means I went to Stockholm. But Why Stockholm? Bjorn. Bjorn. Bjorn Borg. Oh, that Bjorn. Uh I almost say that if I was Facebook, I would have done it the same way. What they do is that they roll out a feature, whether it's a privacy related thing or whether it's some part of your profile. They yeah, but I'm streaming the show on my iPhone with a few seconds of delay. The studio was partially financed by the sale of these sponsorship bricks, which give the studio its name, The Brick House. Unfortunately, we have to go. But you can watch Leo all the time at tweet.tv. Going back to San Francisco, there is one more thing. As the late Steve Jobs used to say, let's pay a quick visit to Silicon Valley. Mountain View, California, where there's no mountain and there's no view. We visit the obvious, uh, the Google campus called the Googleplex, uh, the Hewlett and Packard Garage, which is considered the birthplace of Silicon Valley, a historic landmark. We also visit the Apple Garage, where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded the Apple Computer Company. And uh, next, of course, we visit the mothership itself. They have a store where you can buy t-shirts, mugs, and other stuff with the Apple logo on it. Pretty cool. But the gem of this Silicon Valley journey is without a doubt the Computer History Museum. The exhibits are very extensive, from the first calculator, which is the Abacus, to the early pocket calculators, classic video games, the Altair, the Apple One, the Apple II, the original IBM PC, early digital gadgets, failed robots, and so much more, so much stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm in heaven. Just giving the presentation, this guy was standing right in front of me, looking right in my face. But I allowed it because his name was Steve Wozniak. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the Babbage Difference Engine. The Babbage Difference Engine is an early mechanical calculator designed by Charles Babbage in the 1800s, but the machine couldn't be fully built until the year 2000. And lo and behold, it worked. Welcome to the Computer History Museum's presentation of the Babbage Difference Engine number two, serial two. That's its official name. Now the first three words of that, Babbage Difference Engine, Babbage is the name of the guy who designed it. And that's his portrait over there. And my guess is that, that was taken in London around the time of our Civil War. That's about how we looked at that time. Um, the third word, engine, uh, you may have your own concept of what an engine is, but mine is this. Something that relieves you from having to do the work. We get a lengthy explanation of how this incredible machine works, and so I will leave you with some of that. Although I will post a longer version. Uh, nearly uncut very soon, so look for that on YouTube if you're interested. For now, we are saying goodbye to California. As always, thank you for watching and see you on the road. And, and reset. And the, even the odd and the even reset. And you'll notice it's pretty good results. So we've kind of through five iterations. Now the reason for that is we have a computer prepared set of answers as to what it's supposed to be. And we have them for 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. So we don't have it for all, all the answers. And here's what I've got. Okay. 
So forget all the zeros at the beginning. Five nine six seven four eight eight zero one. Yeah. Answer. What, what you call them? Fifteen. 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 Pro. Okay. Five nine six seven four eight eight zero oh, one. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have just verified that the that the Babbage has verified the computer is correct. <laughs> or is it the other way around? <laughs>